Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the Walter Reed Theater. Uh, before we begin, just a couple of announcements. First, I would like to say that immediately following the screening, we'll have the pleasure and privilege of having a Q&A with the director, Vim Venders, so if you can, please stay. Uh, second, that uh, Mr. Venders' film, Kings of the Road, one of his great masterpieces, will be shown next Saturday here at the Walter Reed Theater at 2 p.m. That's part of an ongoing series we have celebrating 50 years of the New York Film Festival, so that's the film we're showing to represent that particular year, which I think was 1976. And the last announcement is that our series, our annual series, Dance on Camera, will begin here at the Walter Reed on January 27th and goes till January 31st. So for those of you who are uh, interested uh, in that great subject of the interaction between choreography and cinematography, please get the schedule because it's a really wonderful series and there are some great, great things. Um, right now, I'd like to introduce a major filmmaker. We've had the privilege of showing many of his films over the years in our programs, and of course, with the film you're about to see, I think he's really opened up an entire new field of uh, how film and dance can come together in a most extraordinary way. Please welcome Vim Venders. <laughs> We're going to see each other afterwards. So I must make sure that I'm not saying anything that we might be talking about afterwards. But then again, this movie had the longest history. It actually started in 1985. So I can tell you a little bit about what happened what led to this film, and not more than that. And then I leave you again. I was really the least likely director to make a dance film when I was first introduced to Pina Bush. I was introduced to her against my will. <laughs> I'm not joking. I'd never heard of her. I had lived in America in the late 70s in up to the mid 80s. And I was in Venice, Italy, and I'd never heard of Pina Bausch because I think she came to America later. And uh, I wasn't much interested in dance. And my girlfriend at the time, as we were strolling th through Venice, she saw this poster announcing a retrospective by Pina Bausch and she said, that's where we're going tonight. <laughs> and I said, certainly not. <laughs> There's stuff you can do in Venice. <laughs> <laughs> Spend the night in a theater watching dance and thinkable. Include me out. <laughs> so I caved, I caved in, ready for a boring night. And it became a night that really truly changed my life. I've, this was a double bill of Café Müller and Sacre du Printemps. Café Müller, at after four minutes, five minutes into the play, saw me on the edge of my seat in tears, and I did not understand what was happening to me. I really had no idea. I was weeping. I didn't know why, but I continued and. My brain had no idea what had struck me, but my body knew everything. So I trusted my body. And in 40 minutes, this woman, this unknown woman, Pina Bao, showed me more about the relationship between men and women than I'd ever seen in any movie and in the whole history of cinema. I could not believe it. The whole thing without a word. Just six dances and music, and that was it. And I was depleted, and I needed the half-hour intermission to get back to my senses and realize how big this was what that had happened to me. And then Sacre du Printemps started, and that completely did me in. I was a pulp at the end of that. 
I just knew I had to meet this woman, Pina Bausch. And I don't remember how this happened, but I had coffee with her the next morning. And we had a conversation, which is a euphemism because she didn't say a thing. <laughs> <laughs> and normally, I don't say a thing either. <laughs> but I had to speak because I was just so completely full with stuff and it was so unbelievable what had happened to me. So I spoke and she listened and looked at me and smiled and lit one cigarette after another and I was smoking as well. Mind you, this is 1985. <laughs> so, but she just looked at me and I f never had anybody look at me like this. I never saw eyes like this. I never saw anybody who could see through some through me like she did. And it wasn't unpleasant. It wasn't like I was felt naked. I just felt seen. And her eyes were also kind eyes. So I kept talking. And eventually in my juvenile enthusiasm I said, we have to make a film together, Pina. And I thought that would get a reaction. No. She lit another cigarette. And I changed the subject. And then I didn't see her until a year afterwards when I came to see her new piece in Wuppertal and I got to see her own theater for the first time. And she recognized me instantly and came to me and said, Wim, you spoke about a movie, as if it had been the other day. Spoke about a movie that's certainly interesting. We should talk about it more. And that is the beginning of this film. It took us a long time. It took so long, be not because I, w I mean, it had been my idea in the first place, and Pina picked up on the idea and really pushed for it after a while, but it took so long because I just did not know, when I seriously thought about it, I did not know how I could possibly do it. Each year I would come to Wuppertal and see a new piece, and I would meet Pina in other places in the world and would see her work over and over again, and each time I would sit there and stare at it and would just not know how I could possibly film it, how I could film this splendor, and how my craft would somehow get hold of it. And, and I felt whatever I would put on a screen would be irrelevant or could just not do justice. And I, so I had to tell her and that I didn't know how to do it as much as I wanted to. And I would have dropped everything to do it, but I didn't know how. And Pina was patient with me. She said, well, think harder. Because <laughs> she was sure there had to be a, a better way to film dance. And she didn't expect nothing else and nothing less from our collaboration than to find a better way to film dance. So the responsibility was heavy and I was stalling for time for 20 years. Really. Each year she would ask me, do you know now? <laughs> yeah. In the end she wouldn't even ask anymore, she'd just raise her eyebrows. <laughs> and, and finally one day I found the answer. Not in my soul and in my brain, but in something as profane as a new technology. I saw a concert film. Didn't expect much except that I liked the music and I went to see it. I thought it was going to be fun. U2 3D was the ingenious title. And, <laughs> and there was this, <laughs> and there was a solution to f of 20 years of thinking and of torturing myself and of looking at the entire history of dance films and not finding the answer of how to do a film about Pina's work. And there it was, all of a sudden, it was so obvious. Space was there for the very first time as a tool. And, and I realized that had been the problem, that had been the invisible wall because space in movies for 110 years had been a fiction. Whatever cameras had done, for all these years, 
you can put it on tracks, on cranes, on put it handheld, on steady cams, whatever one would do with a camera and it on a two-dimensional screen. So space was always fake. And for the first time it wasn't fake anymore. And I realized that in the first minutes of this film U2 3D, the screen was gone. Out of a sudden it was actually a window and you could see through it and there's things in front of it. And I realized that was the way to do a dance film. I truly believed that was this new medium was made to film dance. And I called Pina as soon as I could talk to her and the credits were rolling. I said, this is the way to do it, Pina. I think we can do it now. There is a way to film dance. There's a different way to film dance. It took us two years to get ready. And we planned it together and thought about it together and talked together for a long time and often. And and then Pina didn't get to see the beginning of the film. She died from one day to another in June 2009. And that was the end of the problem of the of the project and the end of the entire adventure because it was it seemed unthinkable to make it without her and I gave up on the film. It was tragic that she had wanted it for so long and now it was too late. The dancers did not give up. They performed even on the night of her death in tears, but they performed and they decided to go on as a company. And two months later, they actually started to rehearse the pieces that Pina had put on the schedule of the dance theater so we would film them. And that was the beginning of this film because the dancers made me understand it was the wrong decision to, to not film these pieces. They might not never be performed again. Pina's eyes were on them. She had rehearsed the young dancers for these pieces. And the dancers made me understood there was another film to do. Not a film with Pina, but a different thing, a film for Pina. And I realized how badly they needed it because none of these 36 people had been able to say goodbye to Pina or thank you. And I realized it was their biggest need and I realized the film that we could make together would be maybe more important for the living than for as an homage to Pina who was dead. And so we decided to jump into it. And that's the film I'm, I want to show you now. It's the film we that was left for us to do and it was a whole different adventure. And we came up with a way how to do it in the course of the one year that we spent together. And now don't be scared that this is going to be a droopy and sad affair because Pina was a very joyful person. Her public image was the opposite. She was always severe and, and withdrawn. And like uh, in our first encounter, I wouldn't say anything. But Pina at work was joyful and laughing a lot. And, and she herself in her hardest times in her life and with her biggest losses, as an answer had created her most joyful work and we remembered that and that's how we approached this film. And I'm looking forward to showing it to you and talking to you afterwards. Bye. Please welcome once again Vim Vendors. of the 40 or so ballets that the Pina Bausch Company uh, or Pina Bausch created over the, the years, how did you choose the ones that are finally in the film? Pina chose those and I was included in the, in the process and uh, it had to be four because they had to be able to be performed in one season, well, two times two. And uh, we also, for our filming, couldn't possibly be shooting longer than for, for over two seasons. 
and uh, four was the maximum. There had to be public performances so we can film them. And uh, Pina, when we sat down to think about which do we pick, the double bill of Kaffee Müller and Sacre de Printon, which for the last 20 years they always perform on one evening together, that was set right away. Pina didn't hesitate for a second. And I totally agreed. So the first two were practically <coughs> there without discussion. And because they're both from the 70s, mm -hmm. we then thought we should pick a new piece. And thinking about what Pina had when we cho choosing, that was 2008, what Pina had done in the years immediately before, <coughs> We quickly both agreed on full moon. Full moon. I think she was here with full moon in 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 New York. That was Fina's most successful piece in the new millennium, and the crew, the company loved it, and Pina loved it. So there we had three, and that was a difficulty because that only left one. And the one we had then to we had thirty seven other choices. And all of a sudden, there was only one to choose from all these others. And we really needed weeks and weeks, and we make constant phone calls. And I s saw a lot of the pieces again on video. And um, we had some favorites in between, like Carnations. I don't know if some of you know that, or Window Washer or Agua. And there was a lot of arguments for each of them. But unfortunately, it couldn't only be one. And then I finally suggested Kontakthof because it is a unique piece in Pina's biography, but I think also in dance history as such because Pina did it first with her company in the late 70s. And that is, I think, never done before. She then, in 1999 or 2000, also did it with a ensemble of senior citizens, dance and experienced senior citizens between 65 and 80. Same choreography, same piece. And uh, immediately before we made the selection, she also came out with a version, the same choreography again for teenagers, dance and experienced teenagers from 14 to 18. So the, same the very same piece was actually done by three different generations. And the seniors and the teenagers were still performing at the time. <laughs> and the ensemble was jealous that they were touring the entire world and they weren't. <laughs> and they hadn't done it for a long time, for an eternity. So all of a sudden the idea to do the three generations of contact of convinced everybody and Pina agreed to it. The four ballets themselves, how many times did you get to film them? We had... For each of them, four public performances. And that meant that we could each time sell half the audience because we needed the other half for our giant dinosaur of a crane. So the crane was either standing on the left side and then people was audience was only sold on the right side or the other way around. It was a logistic nightmare. And so f so we had four performances, and we had always two sets of, s uh, of stereo cameras, so we each time sh were able to shoot two. So we had eight sets of uh, camera setups. And then we had two days for each of the pieces on our own where we could do excerpts. In the public performances, we could never stop. They were or run-throughs, and if we had a problem, we just had to stop shooting, but we were very well rehearsed, and we were always able to shoot for an entire hour, and then luckily there was always an intermission. So we had all together for each of the pieces six days. And when you got to the set, you mentioned in your intro that you were not a likely candidate to film dance because of your own background or whatever, but I'm wondering, uh, when you got to the set, uh, did you already have shots lined up? Did you have ideas of it, or the approach, and how would you come together with that? Oh, we were really well pr 
prepared because the thing about 3D is that the spacing is so incredibly important. You have to be at the exact right place for every moment of the piece because in order to be able to read the architecture of the choreography right, and actually there is, for every moment, there is an ideal place. So I, I knew all these pieces by completely by heart. I dreamt about them and I knew every second and I knew where we had to be. So for the live cameras, there was up to 150 camera positions in one hour where we had to be. That was a challenge, but fun. <laughs> and um, and then for the extra days we had, we could be with the camera on the stage, which we couldn't, of course, with the audience. We could just go with the crane very close and sometimes actually a little bit in the way of the audience and uh, everybody who felt that their vision was impaired by the cameras could afterwards get a ticket for the premiere. And there were m many more people than could have possibly been in these performances. <laughs> <laughs> They, they found a way to all prove us that they were, <laughs> that their sight had been <laughs> impaired by our cameras. So <laughs> we had to have in Wuppertal. We had today two day. We had two days of premieres because so many people showed up. We said, we were there, and here's <laughs> our ticket. <laughs> and so. And during the course of the screen, the uh, filming, could you ever actually see what the three D would look like, or? Did you have to extrapolate and imagine what it would look like in the end? No, we had live live monitor on 3D. So and you could watch it in 3D. We actually had a it. screen that was in a different room where we could watch live. But actually that for that you had to leave the theater, so and that was not possible. It had to be in the theater. So and actually watching the 3D monitor and watching the cameras and the live stage performance at the same time was nerve-wracking because you constantly had to take off the glasses and and it got it got too complicated and too tiresome. So I ended up watching without glasses and my 3D consultant saw everything. I mean, for technical reasons, live, and he made notes if something was if there was a problem or. If he had to alert us of something, and I just thought in two—I mean, I just thought in 3D anyway because I was watching the real thing. <laughs> Does lighting have to be very different for 3D? Yeah, yeah, that was a huge uh, issue because stage light was not enough. 3D eats a lot of light because you have to shoot not only with two cameras, but the two cameras are connected with a mirror because they really have to be as close as your eyes, which is seven to eight centimeters, I don't know, three to four inches. And cameras are too big to be that close, so you have to be, they have to be on top of each other. And they're connected by a semi-transparent mirror. And that's the only way that two cameras can be in the same axis as two human eyes that close. And that mirror, that mirror eats two f-stops, so we had to bring up the light and that was quite difficult because it had to be, of course, we couldn't interfere with the lighting, so it had to be identical, f at least afterwards on film. For the people who saw these performances, it was a brighter stage than normally, but we had to do it so that the overall balance in the end was giving the same impression. So that was actually the only interference we had to do in order to be able to shoot in 3D. Pino was very much aware of that when we had talked about how we would shoot in 3D. She was aware that we had to boost the light levels. Let's get some questions from all of you. Hey. Yes. <laughs> Out there. Yes, gentlemen over there. His voice was carrying good. You don't yes, have I to know. Question, <laughs> question about the settings. Um, I have to 
explain a little bit what these exteriors are or were, because we first shot these the four pieces as such, and that was a month. We had a week for each of them. And then we took a long break, because after that, we basically didn't know what else to shoot, because we had really jumped back into, th into the film. And, and it was of paramount importance to s record the pieces, to save them, to have them, because we couldn't possibly do that anymore afterwards. And, uh, and then we were just without a clue how to make a film out of this, because the four pieces in themselves were not going to constitute a film. So, and I went and started editing and continued to be in touch with the dancers and think about what else can we do together, the dancers and I. And finally came to the conclusion that we could make this film only by assimilating as good as possible Pina's own working methods and really immersing ourselves into her working process. And uh, Pina's method had been quite unique. She had developed for the last 30 years all of her pieces with a system of questioning her dancers. When she started a new piece, and it was always a work of several months, when she started a new piece, she knew what she had a f an inner vision, what the subject of the piece was, but she didn't create choreography. She thought about the subject, and she had she developed sort of a catalog of questions around the subject, all sorts of detailed questions and intim intim intimate questions and general questions, and she would ask that her dancers questions. And they were not allowed to answer with words, but only with their bodies, with gestures and movement and dance. And Pina would take these answers very literally. She would say, well, that is a bloody simple answer you gave me. <laughs> Can't you be a little bit more explicit? Or this is a cliche that you showed me, but not an answer from your heart. Go again and show me something that you can tell me about this question. And she really forced them and came back, and the next day she would say again what you showed me yesterday. I'm sure you can be more precise. <laughs> so she started to work on these answers, and if she liked an answer, would really sometimes work for weeks on, on the answer until it was a piece of choreography. And uh, in the end of this process, she had a hundred hours of material, and she distilled the piece up and made selected two to three hours from this wealth of material, all circling around that subject. And that's how she developed her pieces. And we realized, the dancers and I, that this was the only possibility for us also to come close to the spirit of Pina's work by adopting the method. So I developed also a catalog of questions that I would ask the dancers. And my questions, of course, were about Pina and about their relationship, and mainly a lot to 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 most of the dancers what Pina had seen in him or her that he or she had not even known about thems themselves. And they showed me lots of answers to these questions about Pina and and uh, as I'm not a choreographer, the rule of our game was that they could only answer with something from the wealth of material that developed with Pina, and that Pina's eyes had been on it. I couldn't judge, I could not have possibly judged an improvisation. So, but they had lots of answers to my questions, and in the end, we did this in the rehearsal room, I had also way too much, hours and hours of answers to my questions about Pina. And then I also started to select and picked one for each, or one or two for each, and also so that the entire sum of all these answers would give sort of a complete image of Pina's world. And then we realized we're not going to shoot this on the rehearsal stage. That was a crummy old movie theater that Pina worked on for 30 years. 
an old empty movie theater and it was in itself not very attractive and too dark anyway. So we realized the only chance we had was the world outside because we didn't even have a stage and there was no sets by nature for these answers. So my ambition then was for the next few weeks to find a place in Wuppertal in Pina City or in the surrounding neighborhood and nature or the industrial wasteland around to find one place for each and every answer. And a specific place that would really correspond to the answer and that would bring out the best possible way what the dancer wanted to show us about Pina. And that's how we finished the film. That became the bulk of the film, the second half that we shot from spring to summer in several installments was all these answers. That was really the main part of the film. Then. And that's why, and that's what brought all these strange places into the film. The hanging train and the traffic island and I mean all these places that are really mainly in the city of Wuppertal. Another question here. All the way no in the back? Let's oh, I'm sorry. Listen to this gentleman. What was most important in your shooting of those sequences on location? Was it the performance itself or? The performance itself was of paramount importance. And in my vision, I, I knew these places and I saw the performance in the place. And I knew for each of the dancers what they needed in terms of surface. And some had said they could easily do it on asphalt and others said they would even like to do it on stones and mud and, and all sorts of stuff and some needed a smooth surface. And then we tried to, we started to rehearse in these places and they started to find how they, how well they could do it there. And only afterwards we started to choreograph the camera, so to speak, in response as a reverse choreography to the dancers. And this, this was in the second half of the shoot and 3D had made, technology had made incredible progress in that time from the fall of 2009 to the summer of 2010. For these solos outdoors, we shot all of them already on Steadicam. So the cameras were actually quite mov movable. We also had tracks, so we worked flexible and we could really move around them. and and in all terrains were able to move and dance with them. And but the main, I mean, the main aspect was always the choreography. And the choreography, of course, was something that Pina's eyes had been on. And at any given moment, there were at least two dancers present to help me see the dance aspects because I'm not trained enough to see if each and every take that we did was good and sometimes the dancers themselves were unhappy and said let, let me do it again and frankly sometimes I didn't really see why and only slowly started to understand more and more why why something had to be repeated and Dominique Merci who was always present he's the oldest dancer he was the dancer of the first hour with Pina and he's now the artistic director together with her long-time assistant, they were always there in order to help me with the dance aspects, which I could not have judged. I learned a lot. All the way in the back there, where is there? Do you see yourself collaborating with New York City Ballet or another company on another dance film? Well, the relationship with Pina was so special and we were so close friends and this happened over such a long time. I'm, I still don't think I'm a specialist or actually I hate to be a specialist <laughs> in anything. And this work was so particular because I, I didn't expect I would be working directly with the dancers. I was, the film I had in mind and I was planning with Pina was watching Pina at work. And for 
with Jean Pina's Eyes at Work, that was the subject of my film. And out of a sudden, I was alone with the dancers, and I had this personal relationship with them, and deve we developed a film together. And so I was in a position that I never thought I would possibly be in. And, and of course, I learned a lot, and it was fantastic to, to really know this world from inside out and have this utterly privileged tool at the same time, this 3D tool that I still feel is completely ideal for dance and and there's this fantastic affinity between the medium 3D and dance and I think it will be difficult in the future to do an, a great dance film in any other way from now on. And But I don't think I'm a specialist and I'm not quite sure if I would want to repeat the experience because it was so unique and so powerful and also, the relationship with the dancers was so extraordinary. We really worked closely together for one year, and I got to know them really well. And and I don't know, at the end of a year of working with them, I realized when it was all over, and I started to work in the editing room and saw each and every one every day, I realized I'd actually worked with these people, 36 of them, for one year. and. I really promise you, this is the truth. Not once had a single complaint or one single scene of jealousy. And that, I think, in the dance world, in the acting world, in movies, is completely unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have two actors that make a movie, you have a jealousy problem on the first day. <laughs> <laughs> and from what I know about ballet companies and theater troops, it is ine inevitable. And there was not one complaint and not one issue. So I was r working under extremely privileged circumstances and it'll be hard for me to want to go back to that. Yes, Ray. Siri said that one hallmark of Pina Bausch's work is that the dancers, when they dance, seem to be almost oblivious to those who are around them or other things that are happening. And it reminded him of uh, one of Wim Wenders' films, Wings of Desire, the whole role of the angels, which have a similar kind of all-seeing, transcendent quality. And I wanted to ask Wim Wenders about that connection, if that's something in his mind as well. Well, some of the secret of Pina Bausch's company is definitely that Pina worked very hard in eliminating every sense of role-playing. The actors, dancers were, ut were forced to be utterly themselves. Already in, the, in this process of asking questions and expecting very, very honest answers, they were forced to be completely themselves. And Pina's work was a search for identity at every stage of the work. So they were really resting in themselves and, and, and that created a different ambience other than normally in movies or I guess with other companies. Because they were, each and everybody was in his own sphere, and and then when we shot outdoors, people were generally quite unimpressed with us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe you saw. I mean, on the traffic, and when we were shooting in traffic, I mean, the drivers are, are driving and. Maybe you <laughs> saw, we, we were shooting this during the World Soccer Championship, and every second car has this German flag on it. <laughs> so they were, in their minds, all playing soccer. 
they didn't really interfere with us. So we were, I mean, I don't know, it was one of the little miracles of this s industrial city. Nobody ever looked into the camera, nobody ever stopped and asked us. They all just walked their way. And and that you mentioned Wings of Desire for me is, of, is quite um, important because when I encountered Pina's work, what I told you before the film, when I first saw her work, that was in 1985, and I saw, in that retrospective, I saw each and every piece. I stayed for a whole week and saw, got a whole overdose of Pina's work, and so in the following years as well. And I didn't make a film until two years later, and that first film I made after I had encountered Pina was Wings of Desire. And that definitely was by far the most choreographed thing I ever did in my own work. And I don't think, I mean, it's not, I can't say it's consciously that because I met, met Pina, I made this film, but th that film was deeply impregnated by our encounter and by being so impressed with Pina's work. And I did steal from my own film for this film for Pina, and the idea to have the dancers' voices as if you could listen to their thoughts was a, st a straight steal from Wings of Desire. Uh, because, yes, because I had promised Pina not to do interviews. Mm -hmm. Yes, we were there. <laughs> <laughs> I had promised two things to Pina. <laughs> <laughs> and that had been sort of the ground rules from the first day that we talked about the film. Two things, then. No biography. Pina just was a modest person and she didn't want to make any fuss about herself, so she didn't want this to be about her. And so when I ended up making the film without her, I remembered that ground rule. And of course you see her for a few moments, but altogether I never felt I was in any way doing a biopic. I said, it was a film about the work. And the second ground rule was no interview. And I promised Pina she would not never have to answer any question. She would never have to e interpret or explain her work. She hated that. And I've seen hundreds of hours of interviews with Pina when we edited the film because she traveled a lot. And of course, she gave interviews. But with each and every one, I mean, it's heartbreaking. You realize she feels like she's betraying her work with everything she says about it. So I respected her rules of no interviews. And I didn't interview the dancers either. And what you hear in the film, their <coughs> voices and their little comments about the work and about the relationship is actually almost an afterthought. It, I really thought I'd, I was going to edit the film without words, completely without words. and did that for the longest time until the very last stage of the editing when I first showed the film to some of my friends and realized some ah. of them were a little lost. And they didn't know Pina and didn't know anything about her, which was good. And I realized they needed, needed a little, some, a l some clues about the relationship to the dancers and about the work process. And I remembered that in these months that I had worked with the actors on their answers, I had had long talks with each and every one of them about how they entered the company and how they understood Pina's method and how they gotten involved. And this was just a crummy tape recorder and only for me to remember it. And I listened to all these tapes at the end of the editing process and found snips, snippets from each and everybody and played them their own tapes and asked them to record these lines again as if it was an interior voice. And that's how these things came upon. And I think we can't call those interviews. <laughs> <laughs> Last one here, yes. He called his name, yeah. He called his name, yeah. He calls him 
Andre. In all of Pino's pieces, the dancers always have their own names, and he calls him Andre. He calls, he shouts for him a couple of times before he jumps in his arms, right? Yeah. There were, on stage every now and then there was dialogue, and those who of you who have seen Pino's pieces, you know that sometimes there is pieces of dialogue. But I think in the film it just, it could very well be the only words. No. <laughs> in the piece as well? You're right. <laughs> Pina herself, yeah, I mean, b but by the dancers. No, Pina speaks, of course, yeah, sure. Okay, one last one right here. Yes, sir. Why did you feel the need to shoot with a live audience? It was my only chance to get these pieces. <laughs> the company needed the live performances in order to perform these for a week. I could not have possibly bought a week of seats. And they needed the audience and they needed the live performances in order to afford the, st the set and the time and so and I also showed the audience. I mean every now and then you see that some of the heads of the audience you, you sit in like almost your position there in the middle of the of the auditorium where Pina was always sitting and we have a number of shots from the center of the auditorium. And these are I mean stage performances. I felt it was absolutely imperative that you would see this also and that you would be aware that this is stage. And uh, that was the only way to be able to shoot them, shoot these pieces for a whole week, every day. That was the necessary condition that there was an audience. The company could not afford to do it for us for a week without an audience there and vice versa. Let's give it a very last question. Okay, one more. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I made the right choice for the last question too. <laughs> 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 the monorail is fun, huh? <laughs> Actually, I filmed in that monorail 40 years ago. Seven, 1970, yeah. In 70, 1972, or 73. Actually, that was the very year that Pina took over the Wuppertal Ballet, and in that year turned into the Wuppertal Tanztheater. That very year, I shot Alice in the Cities, one of my first films in Wuppertal, and it also shot in there monorail because I was obsessed with means of transportation and <laughs> we shot on all sorts of means of transportation. I had to include the monorail and we shot a huge section of the film in Wuppertal and we didn't know of each other, Pina and I, but it was the same year that she started the company and I really made what I considered my first film of my own and the monorail was an essential part of it and I loved it and I still love it and it's part of the glorious past of the little city of Wuppertal because it was built in 1900, same year as the Eiffel Tower, just horizontal, <laughs> same technology basically, and a fantastic thing in, in, a, in 110 years, it, had nev it never had an accident. Oh yes, it had one. An elephant jumped out of it. <laughs> <laughs> because one of the stations of the <laughs> monorail <laughs> is the Wuppertal Zoo, <laughs> and they had this sick elephant, and they needed to take it to a doctor. It was an Indian elephant, and it fit into the it fit into the monorail, and they transported it to the other side of the city, and the little elephant panicked and jumped out, <laughs> and broke a leg, and only died um, thirty years later. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Vim. Thank you very much for Thanks. coming.